Um, well, yeah, sure. Do you mind standing up by the podium thing and I'll see what it looks like? I was saying in church we would always say the people that were late had to sit in the front. Uh, right. It work out that way. But these are kind of comfy chairs. So. It's actually not that bad. Let's just leave it. Okay. I think we got to get this party started. <laughs> I grabbed whatever I'm looking for. Do you like it? It's okay. If it was fun, then. Oh, is that really loud? Is that too loud? Yeah. Okay. Okay, everybody take a seat. Let's get this party started. Okay. You're right, Levi. The audience is good with that. I'm going to save for it. so many of our members here by acknowledging a few people um, that really need to be acknowledged. And the first person is Reb Kitchings. Can you stand Woo! up, Reb? Oh. Hey. Hey. And the reason I'm pointing you out, Reb, is because you really encouraged me to start up this um, FAR meetup group Yay. in Redlands. Uh -huh. And Yay. without that, who knows if it would have even happened. So thank you for really encouraging me to do that. I mean it. Thank you. And the second person is um, Jeff, who left. That's really too bad. I didn't know we had to leave early. But um, Jeff Pogi is uh, the co-founder of FAR. And it was Jeff's idea. Uh, it's it's a funny story because I had the idea, not knowing Jeff also had an idea to start a, a group in Redlands, and then we happened to meet. It was just synchronicity, and Jeff is the one who told me that we need to find a group of people before we go live because that group of people will have some good ideas. And so some of our committee members, there's ten of us total, are here tonight. And these are the people who help uh, come up with ideas and plan events and such. So, um, Rebecca. The one that's on seven. <laughs> and uh, Yash is on our committee. And uh, Hong Wei is also on the committee. And Oma is on the committee. Um, uh, and am I forgetting anyone who's on the committee that I... 
And be back? No. <laughs> okay, so tonight we're having five speakers, which I think is the perfect amount. Okay, so, um, oh my gosh, and I want to thank Jeff and Yush for offering to host oh, yeah. this. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, so, growing up, I knew two priests, okay? One was Father Peter Snyders. Uh, he was the priest at the church that I went to, the Assumption Church as a child. He is deceased now, but he um, is now on an official list. This list included deceased priests and priests who are still alive. Um, he is on an official list of clergy members who are, quote, likely involved in the sexual abuse of minors. Mm. The other priest I knew was Father Antonio Marfori. And this is the man that my mom worked for. He had several secretaries. She was one of his secretaries. She worked for him for over a decade. And over the course of this decade, he conned her out of thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. Uh, this isn't something that my family knew anything about until my mom went into an assisted living and we had to like figure out her finances and all this. So we decided um, not to take him to court. The St. Cloud Diocese um, settled with us out of court. Uh, so I should also say that Father Tony, that's what he likes to go by, um, has also been accused of uh, child molestation by two 15-year-old, uh, two guys that when they were 15 um, accused him of uh, child molestation. And they are taking him to court. So these are the two priests that I uh, experience, had experience with growing up. Um, however, uh, these men of the cloth, as they're uh, described, aren't the reason why I left, because these two stories only came to light three, two, three years ago. Okay? So, yeah, I was born uh, into a Catholic family. I am the ninth of ten children. And I grew up on a hog farm in the Midwest where everyone in my small town was either Catholic or Lutheran. I literally did not know that other religions existed. <laughs> and I certainly didn't know that there were people in the world that didn't believe in God. I mean, I didn't even know the word atheist all throughout my uh, first 18 years of my life. Um, so in this Bible bubble, uh, that was that curious slip of the tongue in my <laughs> In this Bible bubble, um, religion wasn't, uh, I've never discussed religion so much in my life as since I've become an atheist, which is really ironic. Because in this bubble growing up, um, religion was never discussed or questioned, right? Um, it was something that we just did. It was a doing thing, right? By going to church every Sunday, um, and receiving, you know, confessing our sins two, three times a year, and, you know, receiving the holy sacraments as they came along. So baptism, which I obviously don't remember, because that's when you're born, but, you know, first communion, confirmation, I don't know, there's like six or seven holy sacraments. So all this time, I um, definitely believed all the stories in the Bible, that God created the world in seven days, Mary was, was a virgin who was visited by an angel who told her that she was going to give birth to the Son of God. I believe Jesus died for the sins of the world. And I believe that he rose from the dead in three days. I believed in heaven. I believed in hell. I believed in purgatory. And I definitely believe that God was omnipotent and omniscient and that he could hear every one of my prayers. And sometimes he decided to answer them, and sometimes he didn't. So this was my whole childhood. Then in 1987, I graduated from high school. And then that fall, I left home, and I went off to college. And what happened then is I just never went to church again. I don't remember consciously deciding not to. I just simply didn't. And steadily from that point forward, without a single relapse, I never really had any struggle with religion. Um, it didn't happen because of any powerful book I read or even any really influential, influential 
uh, person I read, and it definitely didn't have anything to do with this desire to rebel against my upbringing. I think that leaving my religion, and more specifically leaving God, was something, it was a decision that was just patiently waiting on the sidelines until I was just able to get out of that very insular bubble that I described early so that I could gain some necessary objectivity and, you know, do away with the ritual and the bubble. And once I physically removed myself from that environment, I uh, pretty quickly um, came to the conclusion that it was all a bunch of bunk. Um, so the fact is, I don't miss any part of it. I missed singing in a choir, which I solved that problem by joining the Redlands Community Choir. It's <laughs> fine. Um, so religion, the reason I don't miss it is because, well, there's many reasons, obviously, but mm, the two main reasons are religion really kept my family uh, closed up. Um, you know, because of the Catholic Church's conservative stance on most social issues, you know, I grew up in an environment in which we never talked about, um, you know, sex and birth control, um, masturbation, tampons, abortion, divorce, rape. You know, the list just goes on and on. So when I graduated from high school, I was incredibly naive and ignorant. And full disclosure, I didn't even know how a baby was born. I'm not lying. Uh, so... But even worse than that, I think, you know, the fact that as a Catholic, we believed that uh, God has a master plan, we never analyzed or processed anything that happened. And no one has a childhood free of pain and suffering. And so when these things happened, they weren't talked about in any way. And I sometimes wonder if anyone in my town ever processed anything. So for example, there was a boy in my town who very courageously, when he was eight years old, I'm trying to keep it together here, uh, told his mom that his older brother was raping him. This is a Catholic family. Uh, his mother took care of it. She told the eight year old, I'll take care of it. How she took care of it was she told the older boy, um, the perpetrator, that uh, if this kept up, he would have to speak to the priest. Uh, this priest, his father, Peter Snyers, that I just mentioned, has, is on a list of people who have been accused of child molestation. So, um, well, it did continue for five more years. And the boy gave up. He didn't uh, go back to his mom. And you know what? He needed his mom to take concrete action, and she didn't. And this boy, who's obviously a man now in his uh, early 40s, has been in and out of psychiatric hospitals ever since. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when some people grow up in an oppressive environment, they grow up and they uh, become kind of an oppressor, right? It's this kind of learned thing. Or it seems like they become the opposite. And, you know, before I said that I didn't... Uh, rebel, I didn't actively rebel against my upbringing, which is still true. On the other hand, it just so, you know, happens that without religion in my life, as a mother, I have parented my children in the, literally the exact opposite way that my parents parented me. So, you know, there, I encourage my children to argue with me and disagree with me, and I've, you know, assured them and demonstrated um, that there's no topic that is off-limit in our household. And it makes me happy knowing that they are going to go off in the world not being so naive and ignorant as I was um, going out into the world at the age of 18. So, Hank and Levi are here tonight, and um, they're atheists, as am I, as is my husband. And I just want to conclude by saying, like, they are the most kind and moral and decent people that you'll ever meet, and it's not because they are filled with the Holy Spirit <laughs> or because they fear they're going to burn in hell if they're not honest or pick up that trash on the side of the road. Um, it's just because this is the way they've chosen to conduct themselves. So, you know, as all of us know, it, it doesn't require believing in a creator 
to appreciate how amazing this world is, right? Um, I am in awe every day of this world, and I feel super lucky that I'm here. I think it just takes eyes and a real sense of gratitude. Um, so I am really grateful that all of you came tonight and for giving me this time. So thank you so much. Speaker will have to take a picture of the audience while they're up there. Okay. Can you, um, you pass the phone? What? Really? What? What? I don't know where I put my camera. Okay. Right. I know we're gonna see the expressions like they're smiling. We're gonna see how many people fall asleep. Yeah. Uh, right. Okay. So our first speaker is Joe. Let's give Joe a big round of applause. Okay, thank you. My name is Joe. I'm 67 years old. I've been retired a few years. And uh, any time to wear this sport jacket is something I look forward to. <laughs> and uh, I, I like to tell people that very few people have tried to be a Christian more than me. That's because... That's because I was virtually raised by the Catholic Sisters of St. Joseph. The ones that had that modified burqa with the little white triangle on the top of their head. And before I go into all that, I'd like to preface, I think it's best that I preface with three quotes, four quotes, to kind of just explain where I am today before I get into my old story. And the first quote, We've all heard, I don't even know if it's true, but the story is that Gandhi, who was a Hindu, was seen walking with a copy of the New Testament. You may have heard that. And he was, and someone asked him, are you thinking of becoming a Christian? And he said, no, but if I ever find three people who do what's in this book, I might consider joining. My second one I appreciate very much is by a guy named Henry Lewis and Menken, if I'm pronouncing my last name. He died in 56 at the ripe age of 76 and was a well-known uh, journalist, satirist, yeah. and, uh, satirist yeah. and, uh, at the first uh, half of the 20th century. And he wrote, and I agree with this so much, and I think it is time, it's time for us. He says, one of the most irrational of all the conventions of modern society is the one to the effect that religious opinions should be respected. That they should have this immunity is an outrage. There is nothing in religious ideas as a class to lift them above other ideas. On the contrary, they are always dubious and often quite silly. And then, this quote here, from uh, Thomas Paine, Saint Thomas Paine, we should call him Saint Paine. <laughs> In his book, of course, The Age of Reason, he said the following. So for anyone who still tells you that this country was founded on the Christian religion, our founding fathers said the opposite. So he wrote in his book, The Age of Reason, and I preface, he said, of all the systems of religion, there is none more derogatory to the Almighty. Derogatory to the Almighty. That means an insult to God. Of all the systems of religion, there is none more derogatory to the Almighty than this thing called Christianity. <laughs> as a, as a uh, let me see where I am here. As, a, uh, as an engine of power, and as a means of wealth, it leads to nothing here or hereafter. It produces only fanatics and atheists. <laughs> <laughs> and this is where I am today. And this is what Thomas Paine said in the 1700s. The world is my country. All mankind are my brethren. And to do good is my religion. 
As I said, few have tried harder to be a Christian than me, and that's because I went through 14 years of Catholic education with the Sisters of St. Joseph, from kindergarten through 12th grade. And Sister Margaret kept me back in second grade to teach me how to read. Sister Margaret was a young nun, which made her look human. <laughs> you have to understand that as a child growing up, they never explained anything. I didn't know. We didn't know. There were men. There were women. There were nuns. I didn't know that thing. <laughs> My whole life changed the day I looked through the convent fence and I saw bloomers hanging on the line. <laughs> and my little mind said, you mean they have a rear end? <laughs> Sister Margaret was smart enough to know that I could read, but I was painfully shy. So she had me stay after school, stand to the right of her desk, and read out loud. I haven't shut up since. <laughs> <laughs> the sisters taught me a lot about Jesus. They knew all about Jesus. They had a ring on their finger. They were spiritually married to Jesus. <laughs> One nun taught me that I should always give to the homeless on the street who are asking because you never know who it is. And it could be Jesus testing you. To this day, I see Jesus in all the homeless people I give to. And I often feel guilty if I don't give enough. The Christian religion, um, I was taught that to be a Christian, you must do the work, which is specific. Feed the hungry, clothe the naked, heal the sick, and free the captives. The Christian religion teaching that one is saved by faith alone is false Christian teaching. It is also why you can go and visit any church here in this town of a lot of churches any time throughout the week and you will find nothing going on. <laughs> Sunday, sure. Sunday, showtime. <clears throat> nothing going on. They sit there as giant tax-free monoliths accomplishing nothing and paying for expensive landscaping. If they really were doing the work of feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, healing the sick, then, and only then, would they be worthy of their tax-free status. Amen, brother. <laughs> <laughs> There's no more nuns like before. There's one who was raised in that Catholic church. I can tell you that the nuns ran the day-to-day -day activities of the church and the Catholic school. We never saw the priest. We didn't know what the priests were doing. Only now we know what the priests were doing. And uh, anyway, so then I came to Southern California and I was told that Catholics are not Christians. <laughs> I said, son of a gun, just when I thought I was here, pushed me back up. So, after a few different churches, eventually I studied with a group called the Church of Religious Science, the Science of Mind Philosophy. They had to change their name. They're all called centers for spiritual living. Now they had to change their name because as soon as you said Christian science, everybody went, oh, uh, as soon as you said religious science, they said, oh, Christian science. As soon as you said science of mind, people said, oh, Scientology. In fact, I was told that Scientologists tell people that they are preaching science of mind, which is a lie. Anyway, so, uh, I started with them, and, and they taught me a lot. They learned a lot more about Jesus. I said to myself, well, there you go. See, I believe in the teachings of this man. I, I can call myself a Christian. 
They said, no, you can't. Because in order to call yourself a Christian, you have to believe in the Nicene Creed. I said the Nicene Creed. I had to memorize it when I was in Catholic school. Well, the Nicene Creed, essentially, is the whole thing about born of a virgin on December 25th, crucified, died, and was buried, and rose from the dead. Only problem is that that is 3,000 years of Egyptian mythology that they slapped on Jesus. 325 years after Jesus was born in the Council of Nicaea is where they created what we call the Christian religion today. And so, as we know, the whole story, born of the Virgin on December 25th, died and rose from the dead, is the same story applied to many deities throughout the world, and particularly in Egypt. My son was visiting, uh, as a matter of fact, and he was there in the, in the temple of uh, Luxus. I think it's Luxor that actually has on the wall of the, of the, uh, of, of the uh, Temple of Luxor is the whole story of the Virgin Birth. Many of you are probably aware of this. There's plenty of documentaries that you can study all this. So yeah, all they did was just take all this mythology that had been applied to other deities and slap it on Jesus. But of course, you know, apparently killing the message and worshiping the messenger is common in history. So I couldn't call myself a Christian. Let me see here. After all the churches I had attended, none of them taught me more, I believe, the truth about the Jesus story, except the science of my mm -hmm. group. Ciencia de la Mente, one of my Spanish salesmen told me. And that's where I discovered John 10.34. How funny! You never hear anybody preaching about that, John 10, 34. You don't hear them in church. You don't hear them. They don't hear them on the TV. Oh, no, they don't want to tell you that. Because John 10, 34 is where Jesus said, Jesus never said he was God. In fact, he said the opposite. He said, you are God. John 10, 34. And if I may, I'll give you the story because it's very fascinating. The, the, the teaching is there. When you go to that section of your Bible, John 10, you have what they call the Feast of the Dedication, which is the modern day Hanukkah. And he's in Solomon's temple. And he's with all the big guys, all the power brokers are there, Trump, Rumpowitz, Cheney, they're all there with <laughs> And they said to him, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Now understand, you know, the Jewish religion can tell you. They never considered the Messiah to be God, right? Messiah was never God. That's something that the Nicene Creed created. So there he is, and he said, they said, tell us plainly if you are the Messiah. He says, I have told you plainly, my actions speak for who I am. Now that one phrase flies in the face of all these fundamentalist churches and all the crap on TV that tells you that all you have to do is accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You're saved by faith alone. Well, I'm sorry, that's not the teaching. The man said, my actions speak for who I am. He was saying, I could tell you I'm Sam, I could tell you I'm Superman, but if you don't see me fly in the sky, what good is it? And, and they said to him, uh, they said, so, so they were going to kill him. We're told they were going to kill him. And he says, for what action have I done do you want to kill me? And he says, no, not for any action that you've done do we want to kill you. We want to kill you because you, who are a man, claim to be God. And Jesus responds, John 10, 34, But your own scriptures say, ye are gods. He's quoting Psalm 82. Ye are all gods, children of the Most High, but you shall die as men. He's quoting their own scriptures say, Why do you want to kill me when I say I'm the Son of God? 
Why do you want to kill me when I say that I am the Son of God? What is the problem? Anyway, so what is the message of all that? What could that possibly mean? I believe that it means very simply we're the only creators on this planet. The only person creating anything on this planet is us. And as increased science today proves, we're creating all the time. Whether we know it or not. Whether we have control of it or not. You can go study the new science called epigenetics, in which they have scientifically proven and studied that every cell in your body is affected by your thoughts. So, that's basically where I'm at today. And, you know, I don't know. That's about all I can tell you. And uh, thanks for letting me talk. All right.